Let's see some examples of Shor's factoring algorithm. In general, we're going to consider a semi-prime number n, which is the product of two prime factors called p1 and p2. We want these prime factors to be distinct. That means p1 cannot equal p2. This condition prohibits the scenario where we have a single prime number squared. So n cannot be written as the square of a prime number because these two prime factors have to be different from each other. Another condition which we want to impose is that both p1 and p2 are greater than 2. That means they cannot equal 2. They have to be a prime number which is larger than 2. So that removes 2 from the prime factorization. 2 does not appear in the prime factorization of n. That means n has to be odd. So we're looking for an odd semi-prime number which is not the square of a single prime number. That is the scenario we're interested in. And we're going to take this n as the input to Shor's factoring algorithm. And the output of the algorithm is going to be the two prime factors, p1 and p2. Shor's factoring algorithm begins with a guess. We have to randomly select a guess called a. a is a positive integer between 1 and n. Then we want to compute the greatest common divisor of a with n. Now, if the greatest common divisor of a with n is greater than 1, then we can identify that value as p1. And to find p2, all we have to do is divide n by p1. So if we divide n by p1, we're going to get the remaining prime factor. And that'll be it. So that's, that's it for the prime factorization procedure. But that is only valid if the greatest common divisor of a and n is greater than 1. If we have an equality over here, so if the greatest common divisor of a and n is equal to 1, we say that a and n are co-prime. And in that case, we have to resort to the order finding subroutine. And order finding is done efficiently using a quantum algorithm. And we will see quantum circuit diagrams of specific examples for order finding. So this is actually the quantum part. It's finding the minimum positive integer r such that a to the r is equal to 1 mod n. In other words, we want to find the order r of a mod n. So once we have this r over here, we can use this relationship to find p1 and p2. How is that going to work? Well, consider uh, the procedure of subtracting 1 from both sides over here. That's going to give us a to the r minus 1, and it's going to give us 0 over here. And note that a to the r minus 1 can be written as these two factors. The first factor is a to the r on 2 minus 1, and the second factor is a to the r on 2 plus 1. If this works out, what we're going to have is two factors that are not integer multiples of n, and their product is going to give us an integer multiple of n. When we say something is equal to 0 mod n, we mean that it is an integer multiple of n. And we do not want to have n inside here or inside here. What we want is p1 and p2 to be hidden inside these factors, and they're going to be multiplied by some integer as well. And how can we get rid of those integers? Well, we can compute the greatest common divisor of these factors with n. And that is how we're going to extract p1 and p2. Now, in order for this to work, we need two conditions to be satisfied. We need r to be even. r cannot be odd. It's because we are dividing by 2 over here. We have r divided by 2 in the exponent. We want to get an integer in this exponent. And that cannot happen if we're dealing with an odd value for r. So that is the first thing that has to be satisfied. Once we find the order of a, we have to check if it is even. If it is even, we also have to check this condition is satisfied. So a to the r on 2 cannot equal minus 1 mod n. And minus 1 is the same as n minus 1. So these are equivalent mod n. And what would happen if this was an equality over here? What would happen if these two values were equal to each other? We can substitute minus 1 over here. We would get minus 1 plus 1. That would give us 0. 
So zero means that this would be an integer multiple of n. And that is not what we want. We do not want n appearing inside here. We want p1 and p2 appearing somewhere in here. And that's going to allow us to extract those prime factors using this computation of the greatest common divisor. And that can be done with Euclid's algorithm efficiently. So these are the two important conditions that we need for Shor's algorithm to work. And if it doesn't work, then we have to pick a new value of a. So we have to go back to the beginning and choose a new guess. And hopefully that guess will give us a uh, either the greatest common divisor of a with n will be greater than 1, which will allow us to uh, immediately extract this prime factor, or we will have to resort to the order finding procedure again, and then hopefully we will get an even value for the order, and hopefully this condition will also be satisfied. So now that we've seen a general overview of the scenario of Shor's factoring algorithm, let's have a look at the two smallest examples. So I say smallest because these semi-prime numbers, 15 and 21, are the smallest semi-prime numbers which satisfy all of these conditions over here. So we cannot have two appearing in the prime factorization. That prohibits all of the even numbers. And the next option is three. So we cannot have three squared because that would violate this condition. We need both of these prime factors to be distinct. So that eliminates nine. Nine is not an option. The next option is 3 times 5, and that is 15. And then after that, the next option is 3 times 7, and that is 21. So let's focus on the example of 15 first. So when we're choosing values of a, there are several options that we have. We could either choose a multiple of 3. If we choose a multiple of 3, that's 3, 6, 9, and 12, then when, once we compute the greatest common divisor with 15, we're going to get 3 over here. And if we choose a multiple of 5, which is either 5 or 10, when we compute the greatest common divisor, we're going to get 5. And then if we divide 15 by either 3 or 5, we will get the other prime factor. So this is a lucky scenario over here. But what if we're unlucky and we choose a number that is co-prime? So all of these values over here are co-prime with 15. So they don't share any common factors besides 1. Or in other words, the greatest common divisor of these values and 15 is equal to 1. Well, then we resort to order finding. So what does order finding actually mean? It means we are taking the powers of this value a, this guess a, and we're, we're trying to find the minimum positive integer, which is a power over here, which makes this equal to 1. And for these first three values of 4, 11, and 14, we get a value of 2 up here. So the order of 4, 11, and 14 mod 15 is equal to 2. And 14 is actually very special because it is equal to minus 1. And that means it is a problem. That means it's going to violate this condition. So if we uh, go back to a to the power of r on 2, r on 2 in this context is equal to 1. That's going to give us 14. And 14 is going to cause problems. It's going to violate this condition. It's because 14 is n minus 1. It is 15 minus 1, which is the same as minus 1 mod 15. And luckily, all of these orders over here are even numbers. So over here, we have an order of 2. And the remaining four values, they have an order of 4. So you can see that uh, 1 appears over here. And that's when we raise this value of a to the power of 4. So here we have a a squared, a cubed, and an a to the power of 4. And this gives us 1 over here. Another very interesting thing that you can note is that we have some multiplicative inverses. So 2 and 8 are multiplicative inverses. 7 and 13 are multiplicative inverses. This is only valid mod 15. And you can see that if, if we look at a to the 4, this is a to the r, and then we consider a to the r on 2, this is half of the order. That gives us a to the 2, or a squared. And a squared is equal to 4 for all of these options. And if we get a value of a to the r on 2, which is equal to 4 or 11, we're going to be able to extract the prime factors of 15. So have a look at this example over here. So if we take 4, which is our value of a to the r on 2, then we add plus or minus 1, we're going to get 3 and 5. These are the prime factors. We don't even have to compute the greatest common divisor 
of these values with 15 because we've already achieved these, uh, these values over here. But for 11, we do have to compute the greatest common divisor because for 11, if we add and subtract one, we get 10 and 12. So 10 appears in this list over here. 10 is a multiple of five. And so if we perform the greatest common divisor with 15, we're going to get five. And what about 12? 12 is a multiple of three. It appears on this list. And from 12, we can extract three. So what this procedure does is it gives us a value which we can add and subtract one to, and that gives us two factors. And these factors can then be put into the Euclidean algorithm or Euclid's algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor with 15. And those values are going to be the prime factors. So we've seen how this works for 15. Another interesting thing to, to note is that for 11 and 14, are their own multiplicative inverses. So if the square of a number is equal to one, that means its own, it, it, it is its own multiplicative inverse. And these guys are pairs and they are multiplicative inverses. And another interesting pattern is that the sequence of numbers that appears over here is the opposite order to the sequence of numbers that appears for its multiplicative inverse. So here we have two, four, eight, and over here we have eight, four, two. Here we have seven, four, 13, and then we have 13, four, seven. It's the opposite order, but it's the same sequence of numbers. That's because they are multiplicative inverses mod 15. So that is the smallest example. Now let's have a look at the second smallest example. This is 21. The prime factors of 21 are three and seven. So let's have a look at uh, the multiples of three and the multiples of seven. So if we choose any of these multiples of three, and that's three, six, nine, 12, 15, or 18, and when we compute the greatest common divisor with 21, we're going to get three. And if we choose seven or 14, when we compute the greatest common divisor with 21, we're going to get seven. So these are lucky cases. We can immediately find the prime factors just by uh, substituting this into Euclid's algorithm. And Euclid's algorithm is an efficient way of computing the greatest common divisor of these two integers. But what if we're unlucky? What if we choose a the value of a, which is co-prime with 21. You can see that there are many options over here. There are many possibilities of co-prime integers with 21. So that means the greatest common divisor of these numbers in the top row with 21 is equal to one. So let's have a look at some of the patterns that occur over here. So we have to extend this table a bit, uh, a bit lower because we have orders up to six over here. So six is the largest order that we see. So we will see some repeating patterns. Over here we see eight, 13, and 20 all have order two. That means when you square them, you get one. So they are their own multiplicative inverses. And 20 is very special. 20 is minus one mod 21. It is one less than n in this context. So you can see that this is a repeating pattern. And this is why it's important that we specify that r is the minimum positive integer. We need to say that it is minimum because all integer multiples of r are also going to satisfy this relationship. So we can, we can square r, uh, sorry, not square r, we can multiply r by a constant. We can have two times r, three times r, four times r, and that is always going to give one. So a to the power of a constant times r is equal to one mod n. So these uh, three examples here in the beginning have an order of two. And then if we take a to the r on two, that's just going to be a itself. And here we get eight, and here we get 13. 20 is not going to work because it violates this condition, but eight and 13, they will work. Because if we add and subtract one from eight, that's going to give us seven and nine. Seven appears in this list. In fact, it is a prime factor. And nine appears in this list. It is a multiple of three. So if we compute the greatest common divisor, we're going to get three. And that is how we extract the prime factors. And 13 also works. If we add and subtract one to 13, we're going to get 12 and 14. 12 appears in this list of multiples of three, and 14 appears in this list of multiples of seven. Once we compute the greatest common divisor with 21, we will get the prime factors. So eight and 13 are values that will work. We want a on r on two to equal either eight, or 13. So let's have a look at some of these other values. All of these values are paired with their multiplicative inverse. So four and 16 
our multiplicative inverses, mod 21. So we're 2 and 11, 5 and 17, 10 and 19. So these are multiplicative inverses. And we can see the same pattern where we have the same sequence of numbers, but flipped. It's the opposite order. Here we have 4, 16, 1, and here we have 1, 4, 16. The order of both 4 and 16 is 3. We can see that when we cube this value of a, we get 1. But that is an odd order. So that means this is odd. So it violates this condition. It's not an even value of r. So if we were to choose 4 and 16, we would end up with an odd order, and then we would have to restart. So this would not work. And if we chose 20, we would also have to restart. So it would not work. What about these options over here? If we chose 2 or 11, we would get an order of 6. And then if we take a to the power of r on 2, that's the same as a cubed. So 6 on 2 is 3. And that would give us 8. And 8 works. So this is good. And you can see that the sequence is in opposite order. We have 2, 4, 8, 16, 11. And over here we have 2, 4, 8, 16, 11. It's just the opposite order, but the same values occur in the sequence. And the value over here in the middle, that is a to the r on 2. So this works. 2 and 11 would work. Just like these ones over here, 8 and 13, they would also work. Let's, let's have a look at 5 and 17. 5 and 17 have an order of 6. 6 is even, so that satisfies this condition. But we get 20 over here. When we compute a cubed, which is the same as a to the 6 on 2, we get that it is the same as minus 1, because 20 is the same as minus 1. So this is a problem, and this is a problem. So these values are not going to work. 5 and 17 are not going to work, and we're going to have to restart the algorithm with a new value of a. Let's examine 10 and 19. 10 and 19, they have an order of 6, and if we have a look at a cubed, which is a to the r and 2, we get 13, and that works. So 10 and 19 will work successfully, 2 and 11 will also work successfully, and 8 and 13 will work successfully. 20, 5, and 17 will fail because they violate this condition. a to the r and 2 is equal to minus 1, and that causes this to not work. And uh, 4 and 16 will fail because they violate this condition. There's an odd value of r. So here we have an order of 3. So what are the orders that we have for the co-prime elements? We have an order of 2 for these three numbers. We have an order of 3 for these two numbers. And then for the remaining numbers, we have an order of 6. So we have analyzed all of the possibilities for choosing a guess A, mod 21. So this is an example of how Shor's factoring algorithm would work for 15 and 21. So this is the number theory part, but we haven't yet seen the quantum mechanical part. And that's what we will see in the next few videos. We're going to construct quantum circuit diagrams that allow us to find the order efficiently. For small values that we can write on the whiteboard, it's not a problem computing the order. But for really large practical values of n, this is not something that you can efficiently do on a whiteboard. And in fact, it's not something you can efficiently do on a classical computer. That is why algorithms have been developed which can run on quantum computers and they can do order finding efficiently. So we will see that in the next few videos. Hopefully these two examples of 15 and 21 were helpful for illustrating how Shor's factoring algorithm works.